protecting our goals and dreams, making sure that we are giving ourselves the biggest and best opportunity of watching and enjoying our goals flourish in front of ourselves. This is Sugar Mama's Fire Play and I am financial planner, Canna Campbell. I love publishing this podcast every Monday morning because I make sure that you are starting the week off on an inspired, educated and motivated note when it comes to thinking about all the amazing financial goals and dreams you are perfectly capable of achieving. Now, in today's podcast, we can talk about protecting your financial situation, protecting your wealth. So I'm going to be really reiterating the importance of my general advice warning right now, because in this podcast, I'm going to share with you a lot about myself and some of the financial products that I have and Tom has, and I guess some tips and very important stories as well in this podcast. So if you're listening to this and you think, well, Canna has that, so therefore she's recommending I have that, that's not the case. I'm sharing with this with you because I want to make sure that you understand how important it is to protect your wealth and you understand or have, a, I guess, an entrance into the tools that are available to help protect your wealth. So as you're listening to this podcast and you think, oh my gosh, I need to do something about this. This is really important. Go and talk to a financial planner and get some professional advice. I'm also going to be sharing with you some very helpful free tools and resources, which are going to help you navigate through this area and help protect your wealth. Now, what am I talking about and where does this all stem from? All right. Literally 48 hours ago, I received a DM on Instagram and it went along the lines of this, like, hi, Canna, I'm just chatting away. And then she continued on to say, I was applying for income protection and I was about to hit submit. I thought I would stand up and stretch before double checking my application. Then I had a stroke. I never got my submission in time. I was 33 years old. Please tell everyone. You just never, ever know. People need to know about personal insurances. They need to know about protecting their future, protecting their financial well-being, protecting the success of all of their goals and dreams beyond the financial. Now, have you ever asked yourself, what would you do if you could never return back to work because you'd had a sickness or an injury? How would you survive? How would you still put food on the table, pay the rent, pay the mortgages, look after your family and friends, be able to have any kind of lifestyle where you might go on a holiday, you know, or look at any of your goals and dreams? Do you have enough savings? Do you have enough superannuation? Do you have enough passive income to support yourself and cover your living expenses? And most people, I'd say probably 95% of the people in Australia will say, no. I mean, yes, you might have a little bit of savings, but not enough to cover you for the rest of your life. And yes, you might have some superannuation, which is great because super is very, very important, but you may not be able to access it and there still may not be enough. And whilst you might have a bit of passive income as you're building up your money, mindful money number, it may not be enough. You only maybe say 20% of achieving your mindful money goals. Now, yes, there are social security, depending on where you are based in the world. However, that may not be enough and you may not actually qualify for social security because normally when it comes to social security, you have to go through an assets test and an income test. And if you have a certain amount of wealth, you may actually not qualify. And I actually, I don't specialize in Centrelink at all, but I jumped on the Services Australia website to have a look about roughly what a disability pension you, if you qualify for it. And it is a maximum of at the time of recording this podcast, $1,064 per fortnight. Now that works out to be $27,664 per annum. Could you live off that? Could you live where you're living right now, pay the rent or pay the mortgage, put food on the table, pay your gas, your electricity, your private health insurance if you have it, put clothes on your back? Could you survive? I highly doubt it. And if you could, it would be a pretty miserable existence. But guess what? You can actually help protect your financial well-being through personal insurances, which is really what I want to focus on today. Now, in this podcast, I'm going to be starting with the most, I think, 
in my opinion, the most important and valuable insurances and be working backwards from that. But just because I save, you know, the last one doesn't necessarily mean it's the least valuable, but it's, I really want to make sure that you are listening to this podcast and you listen all the way through to the very end, particularly as I'm going to be sharing lots of stories about myself and what policies Tom and I have and the premiums and how we afford it. Because I want you to go through the podcast and go, right, okay, I'm actually exposed here, but I now know how to quickly go and fix this and who to speak to. Um, it's funny, we don't think twice about insuring our cars, our home, and even a $1,200 mobile phone. But if you are 32 years old and you are earning right now today, say $120,000 a year, and you intend on working to age 65, guess how much income, assuming absolutely no pay rises whatsoever, but also assuming that you don't take any breaks from the workforce to have children or to take care of family members, you will earn up to $3,960,000 between the age of 32 and 65. That's almost $4 million, guys. Uh, Now, if you have your mobile phone insured, and you look at what you're paying and what the value of that phone is, which say $1,200, $1,500, whatever it may be, and then you don't want to insure $4 million worth of income, that is concerning. We really need to, I guess, refresh our approach and mindset towards this. It would be crazy not to look at income protection for your situation, particularly if you don't have enough emergency savings to cover you for the rest of your life, particularly if you have a mortgage, particularly if you have financial dependents such as young children or perhaps you help support your parents or elderly parents or or friends even. So it is so incredibly important that you give this a really hard consideration and look back to your financial situation, but also all the goals and dreams that you have for yourself. It would be devastating if something was to happen to you and you can never go back to work. And not only do you have to exist off, you know, use up all your emergency savings, rely on family and friends, uh, maybe eat up all your superannuation and live off maybe a tiny bit of passive income if you have any, and then also have to live off a, a very small, depressing social benefit from the government. It is absolutely the crazy. We need to be looking at this. Now, for most people, sorry, and what I should have just said is actually, not only do you have all of those things, you'd have to say goodbye, sayonara, to all of those goals and dreams that you had previously set for yourself to achieve. Those dreams of, you know, uh, traveling around the world, those dreams of retiring at age 55 instead of 65, uh, those goals of building up a diversified investment portfolio, those goals of buying up a pro- building a property portfolio, all those goals would go down the toilet if you didn't have an income to learn. That three, let's call, let's call it $4 million because it's so close to $4 million. That $4 million is the lifeblood for so many goals and dreams. Without money, you can't go on holidays. Without money, you can't Uh, pay for that education or your children's education. Without that money, you can't pay the rent. Without that money, you can't pay the mortgage repayments. Without that money, you can't even maybe plan and prepare for retirement because you don't have the cash flow. This is where income protection comes in. So basically what income protection is, is it is a personal insurance policy where you will be paid and about up to 75% of your salary at the time if you cannot work due to a medical condition. And yes, there is a claim process and you have to get you know doctors to sign off and agree that you are unable to return back to work either indefinitely or for a certain period of time, say like a year or two whilst you focus on recovery and rehabilitation and doing special treatments. It is so incredibly important. I, I keep saying this, I'm really, really sorry. But it'll, that 75% income that is paid by the insurance company if you have to go on claim will allow you to, albeit at a reduced lifestyle, I will admit, but at least it gives you some income to help you still pay the rent or stay the, pay the mortgage repayments, keep food on the table, uh, keep working on maybe some of your goals and dreams. So I'm sure you'd have to reduce them a little bit, but it means you can keep your head above water. It means you can stay on top of all of your responsibilities. You might have not have rent or a mortgage, but you might have a hex debt or credit card debt. Um, you might have investment loans. And this is even more so important for people who, like myself, who are self-employed because I'm self-employed, Tom's self-employed. We don't get any annual leave. 
and we don't get any sick leave, we don't get any long service leave. This is even more so important. We are completely responsible and accountable to ourselves, our ability to make income. If Tom and I can't work, we can't afford to live. We can't afford to keep the house. We can't afford to keep the you know keep paying for daycare. We can't afford to even pay for food. This is why you have this protection in place. Now there is a brilliant tool on the government's Money Smart website. They have a calculator which I highly recommend referring to to help you work out the types of insurance that you need and actually how much cover you need. But when it comes to working out how much income protection you need, there are basic things that you can immediately look to to help you work out what are the features of a, and policy benefits you would be of value to you in your situation when it comes to looking at income protection policies and getting prices and quotes. So there are basic things you look at is how much emergency money do you have? How many months could you could that emergency money keep you afloat for? Most Australians don't have enough emergency money. They can barely get into three weeks worth of living expenses before they're then using credit cards and borrowing money from family and friends. Now, if you are one of those people, you would possibly say, well, okay, I can, I've can. i got enough emergency money to survive three weeks, but I need to maybe look at other things to protect me further. You'd also think, okay, well, hang on, I've got, I've never taken a sick day or I haven't, I barely taken any sick days and I've been with my employer a really long time. I've actually got 20 days of sick leave there. So again, you add that into the calculation of of how much income protection you need. And do remember though, that if you leave your employer, you lose all your sick leave that you have accumulated. So you need to keep that into consideration. You also may look at how much annual leave you might have accumulated. Again, whilst your annual leave can be paid out when you leave your employer, when you start with a new employer, you're starting afresh. You're starting from ground zero. You have no annual leave to, to fall back on. So again, these are the things you need to consider. And again, do you have any income protection? Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, delete that part. And again, do you have any passive income? But is it cash flow positive income? So for example, I might say, okay, well, I've got about $20,000 a year worth of cash flow positive income. That will then maybe mean that I don't need to take a policy as expensive and, and with up to the 75%, which might save me money on my premiums. These are all things that you would take into consideration and talk to a financial planner or a mortgage broker, the insurance company in, in helping you work out what is the right level of cover income protection for you. Now, there are typically two types of income protection. One is an indemnity, indemnity style. I'm getting so passionate and getting tongue tied here. Sorry, guys. But it is basically the insurance company will work out how much your claim is and how much they'll pay you depending on the income that you are earning at that time. And they generally will go back to looking at the last 12 months worth of income to work out, all right, you were earning $150,000 in the last 12 months. You're on claim now because you're sick, say with cancer or you've had an accident. You know, you need to take a year off work to, to let your body recover. We'll therefore, you know, base your payout on the $150,000 you've been earning for the last 12 months. The other form is an agreed term. And this isn't as common as, as what it used to be, but basically Basically, where when you submit your application to apply for income protection, you state at the time what your income is and it's an agreed value. So if you go to claim and say if something's happened, you maybe cut down to part-time work because you're raising children, the insurance company will actually still pay you on what you agreed to in that policy. So the two different types, but most people today, when they take out a new policy, it tends to be indemnity style. Me personally, I took out my income protection years and years ago, and I'm on a, an old style of policy where it's an agreed value. I, I have agreed with my insurance company that they will pay me a fixed dollar amount per month after a 90 day waiting period and up to age 65. Now I'll explain what I mean now about the waiting period and to age 65. So when I was working out how much income protection I needed, and I took this out when I was in my early 20s, I worked out I had at least three months of safety nets to fall back on before I'd need to submit a claim. So I had enough emergency savings. I had lots of annual leave and sick leave because I was actually employed at the time with a big bank. Um, I, I had a fallback, so I knew I could afford 90 days. And that is still the case today. I could, So that helped keep my premiums down because the longer your waiting period is, typically speaking, the more cost effective and financially friendly the premium will be. So generally speaking, you can choose between 30 days, 90 days, 180 days, a year or two years. The longer, the bigger the discount tends to come in. 
And you really need to make sure you've you've got you genuinely do have enough money to survive because I might maybe have an accident and have to take 60 days off work. I would not be claiming on my income protection because I haven't met that waiting period. So what a waiting period is, is basically how long can you survive before the insurance company will start paying you? Now, as I said, if you're one of those people that goes, oh my gosh, I've barely got enough emergency savings, I've got big responsibilities, maybe you do need a 30-day waiting period. And that's why you need to talk to a financial planner or an insurance broker or an insurance company and get advice. Now, the other side is something called a benefit period. And that is how long will that insurance claim be met? Now, typically speaking, it's two years or to age 65. And a lot of employers will these days will actually, as part of your package, will actually give you an income protection policy. And more often than not, these policies have a benefit period of two years, which means if you go on a claim and you've met the waiting, waiting period, the insurance policy that's normally owned and paid for by your employer will pay you two years worth of income. Now, that is great. Don't get me wrong. That is a huge benefit. But what happens if after two years, you're still not back at work? That policy is has dried up. It's finished. It's expired. What else are you going to fall back on for income? So in these situations, if you do have for, you know, some policies in place where you have an income protection and you discover it's got two years, what people tend to do is go and take out a second insurance policy that they pay for themselves that has a waiting period of two years and a benefit period to age 65. So what that means is if they were to get sick or be injured, they would claim on their first insurance income protection policy first and know that they've got the first two years covered. And then if they're still not back at work, they then submit a second claim on their second income protection policy, which covers them to age 65. Now, the longer the benefit period, typically the more expensive it is. But I was reading this statistic a couple of years ago, and I can't remember the exact number, but it was basically saying people who hit the two-year mark where they're still not back at work on an income protection claim tend to be in a situation where they will never, ever be able to return back to work. So that's a really interesting observation if that stat is still relevant today. Because what that basically is saying is most people who go on a, on income protection claim basically don't ever return back to work. So it depending on the cost and depending on your situation and you know your assets, your liabilities, your income, your job, your health conditions, it may be a smart move to look at considering to look at ensuring yourself up to a maximum age of 65. And if you think about that example of the 30-year-old or 32-year-old that I just gave that was earning, you know, had $4 million worth of income ahead of them, it makes sense to make sure that they lock in that four, full $4 million rather than just two years worth of income at, I think I said, $120,000 a year. So would you want to lock in $240,000 of income or would you prefer to lock in almost $4 million worth of income? Look at the, do your research and look at the, what the quotes say and whether it's worthwhile. But I know for myself personally, I'd rather sleep well at night knowing that I have cover all the way up to age 65. So if I go on claim, I, my insurance company will pay me till age 65 after my 90 day waiting period. Now, this policy of mine is actually owned and paid through, through my superannuation. I'm not telling you this for advice. I'm telling you this because it's one of the ways I'm able to afford my premiums, which are very expensive, but I would never look at cutting them because I know how valuable it is to lock in my income. Now, Tom also has income protection and his income protection, we actually pay for separately. So there is a component within it that is a little bit of, of his policy because it's packaged in with his other insurance policies, such as life TPD and trauma cover. So he does get a tax deduction or a partial tax deduction for this. Now, I should point out the monthly benefit that you would get paid from an income protection policy is still taxable. So this is not designed to completely replace all of your income. As I said, it's it's around about 75% of what you're earning and it is taxable. So it's not going to make sure that you're living the perfect life and, and maintaining your your same lifestyle. It will it will be reduced. So that is why it's so important that you protect yourself with holistic advice that covers building up long-term growing passive income streams, uh, taking into consideration your superannuation, looking at having lots of emergency savings so that you can help bridge those gaps and those holes if you have to claim on an income protection policy. 
Now, one thing's for sure, no matter how tight our budgets are, and our budgets are really tight right now, I'm not looking to trim or cut down or cut or cancel those policies. The other day I had a lady message me saying she was having an argument with her husband and wanted to cancel their insurances and what did I think? Now, I can't give personal advice, but it is something, it is, if you think about, now that, or I should say, now that you know how important in, income protection is, you'll know that that's not necessarily a great idea. You're putting your family at a huge huge financial risk and if you are on a tight budget and you have expensive insurance policies in place call your insurance company and ask them what you can do to help bring those policies down perhaps you have a rolls royce insurance policy where you can do a couple of things you know extend the waiting period from 30 days to 90 days to help bring the premium down perhaps you can Take off a few extra benefits and, and bells and whistles that are attached to that policy that you don't really value. I'm not recommending you cancel it. I'm not recommending you cut it down. I'm recommending that you call your insurance company, and let them give you advice as to what you can do and see what happens to the premiums and what the savings are there and if it's worth it for you. Because once you've made that decision, you just no turning back. So you are putting your family at great risk and jeopardy. Now, the other things you need to think about is the policy. You, whenever you look at an insurance policy, always read the PDS, read the fine print, make sure you understand it and always get professional advice. Get on the phone, ask questions. There's so much great information on ASIC's Money Smart website. And once that policy is in force, feel good about it, feel proud and feel responsible and enjoy sleeping well at night. Now, the second in my opinion, most important insurance policy, and this is personal insurance, after income protection is trauma cover, which is also often known as critical illness or recovery insurance. Now, this is designed to pay a lump sum amount of money tax-free if you suffer a major critical illness or injury. This includes, but is not limited to, cancer, heart attacks, major head injuries, and strokes. It doesn't include mental health, but it was actually invented by a South African heart surgeon. This famous South African heart surgeon would save his patients' lives. And the problem was, is he noticed that his patients were actually leaving the hospital the more stress and duress than what they did coming in. And the reason why is they had been sitting in hospital for a month, sometimes longer, sometimes less, not earning any money, stressed and worried about all the bills that were piling up whilst they're in hospital and all the new bills that were going to be a part of their lives going forward to help them recover and rehabilitate their lifestyle so that they didn't risk having heart problems again. So he looked at this and was like, we need to create something where people leave a hospital knowing that they can go to a better life and they can afford to reduce the financial stresses. So quite often people will lose, use their trauma cover payouts to pay off some of their mortgage or pay off their mortgage completely so they have a lot less financial stress in their lives. They will use the lump sum payment to help pay for all the medical bills. They will use the money to help pay for a different lifestyle where perhaps they don't work you know, five days a week because the stress and pressure is too much for their bodies, but they look at working say part-time, three days a week, that money is designed to help allow and afford those necessary lifestyle changes and recovery and rehabilitation costs. Now, I also want to point out as a financial planner, I've seen lots of claims and a lot of people think, oh God, like surely this can't happen that often. It happens. People, you know, get sick. Things happen in the blink of an eye. A friend of mine recently found a brain tumor and this was a benign brain tumor but she and then she was a brain tumor that she was getting checked I think once every year once every two years it was no big deal but then all of a sudden it was no longer benign in a very short period of time it became very very dangerous and needed to be removed as an absolute emergency if she didn't get it removed immediately she was going to be paralyzed for the rest of her life now Fortunately, she had trauma cover. So she's currently submitted her claim and, and this money is going to allow her to be able to take the stress and pressure off her life. She can use that money as she wishes. You can use that money to invest, to help build long-term passive income streams. You can use that money to cut back on her lifestyle, not having to work five days a week. She can use this to help pay for you know, more preventative medical treatment so she doesn't need to worry about this again or helps release that stress and pressure. It is really, really valuable. It is, the, I would say, the second most important insurance to have. Now, do I have this policy? You better believe I do. 
And I took this policy out again at the same time I took my income protection policy out. And at the time I took out, I took it actually out before I had a mortgage. And I took it out at the level of cover that would cover the mortgage that I was planning to have in a couple of years when I finally bought my first property. And I still have that policy today and it is increased in value over time. And I'd like to share this with you. I've actually had a change in health. You guys know I'm very open about my mental health challenges. Now, because I've had a change in health, I would not actually be, I wouldn't qualify for income protection. I wouldn't actually qualify for trauma cover. I would be immediately excluded and declined if I was to submit a new application today. So today, even those existing insurance policies I have in place are even more valuable and important to me because I will never be able to replace them. If I go and cancel them, that's it. Bad luck. No insurance company is going to take me on. So please understand a change in health also really impacts and improves the value of of existing insurances that you may have in place before your health changed. Now, does Tom have this cover? You better believe he did. You know, Tom actually never had any income protection, life cover, TPD cover, or trauma cover before we met. And I only discovered this when we bought our house together. And the moment we bought the house, the first call I made was uh, like to an insurance company to make sure that he was properly covered. And we actually chose to pay for this, not out of his superannuation, but out of our own cash flow because we, Tom is at the stage of his life where he's earning more than me. If anything claim happened, I wanted to make sure that I could go straight to an insurance company, not have to go through a superannuation company. Now, there are pros and cons for coming with, with that, which I'm going to explain in a little bit. So keep listening. When, when we worked out these amounts, again, we looked at our financial situation. We looked at how many kids we have, any sort of daycare fees or school fees that we have. We looked at uh, emergency money ha we have. We looked at how much money we had in the redraw facility. We looked at all the safety nets that we have in place so we could help work out what the right level of trauma cover is. And again, go to the Gut Money Smart website. There's some brilliant calculators to help you work out and give you a good ballpark figure as to how much you need. Of course, it's going to boil down to at the end of the day, how much you can afford and what the premiums might be. But you, it is worth your time looking into this. I personally promise. Now, <coughs> as mentioned, Tom has actually packaged up his insurances. So he has them all combined in the one, the one monthly premium. The benefit of doing that is it gets to be cheaper because you're kind of packaging them up so bigger discounts can apply. However, that the downside of this is it comes out of our cash flow. Now, with both trauma cover and income protection, there are two types of premiums. Stepped is basically calculated at each time the policy is renewed and it increases each year based on the higher the risk of you actually going to claim depending on your age. The other option is to have a level premium, which typically is a higher premium at the start of your policy, but the changes don't, the, the premiums don't tend to change too much as each year goes by. So you've got the choice of maybe having a cheaper insurance policy, which is the step policy that will become increasingly more expensive each year, or you can maybe take out a level premium, which will cost you more upfront, but tend to be more consistent in the long run and not be subject to that many changes and increases over the long run. Now, it really boils down to what is right for you. I am impartial as to what is right, but I will point out that no two policies are the same. So you really do need to read the fine print. And you also need to consider, you know, when you read the fine print, what exclusions an insurance company might have. For example, some insurance policies might have, you know, a year waiting period on cancer. Uh, they might have exclusions in place because you may have a family history of heart disease. Um, they may have limitations within the policy. So you need to think about all these things. And again, get advice. And you really do need to do your research. So when it comes to the talking to your insurer, the more details, the better. And I'll talk about the insurance application as well in this podcast. Now, the third most important insurance is TPD, which stands for Total and Permanent Disability. Okay, so what this is, is it is if you are permanently injured or suffer a permanent illness that makes it impossible to return back to work, a TPD insurance policy can provide you a lump sum to help support you and your family pay for medical and rehabilitation costs. Now, there are two different types of policies. You have an own occupation with TPD and an any occupation with TPD. 
your own occupation is quite detailed to what you do for a living. So an own occupation is if you are unable to work again in your job that you were working before your disability, you'll be covered. And it tends to be more expensive and it is only available outside of superannuation. Now, the other option is, is an any occupation. So if you're unable to work in any job suited to your education training experience, this cover will, will pay. And again, it is a little bit more, well, it's quite a bit more cheaper than an own occupation. I want to give you a great example. I remember a BDM telling me about this, this policy that a surgeon had. I think they may have been a brain surgeon and they got Parkinson's disease, which is where you shake. So they had an own occupation TPD policy and they became so unwell, there was no way they could actually operate anymore. So their insurance company paid out on the TPD claim and also on the income protection. But guess what? Because this surgeon was so smart and had an own occupation uh, definition on his policy, he actually was able to go back to work but consult. So he was trained and educated and his experience is for surgery, but he was able to take an income protection claim, take a TPD claim, but also return back to, to work at some capacity as a consultant sitting in on surgery, but not actually being operating himself. So that's a great example to explain the benefit of an own occupation. Now, my TPD is through, is through super, so I have an any occupation. So I, re- I need to be aware that the, being able to meet a claim will be a little bit harder than if I, was, if I was to have an own occupation. But these are things, again, you would get advice around and you would always read the PDS. Now, again, working out how much TPD cover do you need? Well, you'd look at your mortgages, your investment debts, your hex debts even, what it costs to live, how much savings you have, how many dependents you have. Now, you might not have children, but you might have elderly family members that you feel responsible for and want to help look after. Uh, you might have family members that have illness and injuries yourself that you are, you know, you want to help contribute towards or you are, you are partly responsible for. And the other thing you really want to take into consideration, and a lot of people forget about this, is what about your superannuation? Now, you need to think about what your retirement plans are. You might go, okay, well, I've got an $800,000 mortgage, so I'll just go cover that $800,000 mortgage for my TPD cover. That's great, and that's fine. And again, you need to look at the cost of this and how it impacts your budget. But what if you go to claim, you, you pay off the mortgage, that's great. What happens beyond that? Because eventually you need to be able to retire. If you're not working, you've met your claim, and that's great, you might have income protection, but what if there's no money going into your superannuation? What if your income protection doesn't have a super benefit attached? Because some income protection policies will actually include an SG contribution component within the the actual benefit amount that you get paid per month, but not all of them do. This is where you need to read the fine print and understand this. So if you claim on TPD in this situation, you pay out the mortgage and you're not back at work and you've you've got great cover covering you to say age 65, you know, that's great. So mortgage is now cleared. You've got 75% of your income coming in till age 65. What happens beyond age 65 if you don't have any super money going in? This is where you also need to consideration, okay, well, maybe I do actually need a bit more than $800,000 because I'm going to need to get a lump sum amount of money into my superannuation so that when my income protection policy dries up at age 65, I've still got a good amount of superannuation to help me keep me through and keep me going. These are the little things you need to think about because they add up. And yes, of course, that becomes expensive, but it is way more expensive if you don't have this cover in place and you're eating up into all your savings, having to sell off all your assets, which might include maybe the family home, having to take, you know, borrow large amounts of money from family and friends, or even go set up a GoFundMe page, which everyone knows is obviously hard in an economic time where everyone is is tied on cash flow and can't afford to contribute and donate to what we normally would. The thing is, I also like to point out to people when they, they think, oh, do I really need my TPD? You're actually more expensive to your family being alive than dead. I know that sounds really wrong, but if you think about it, say Tom was to suddenly pass away, say Tom was to suddenly not pass away, but it was to be paralyzed in, say, a car accident or an injury at work because he treats horses which weigh like 500 kilos and he became totally and permanently disabled. Not only 
do I have to obviously look after the mortgage, look after the cash flow, look after the, you know, childcare costs, potentially further down the track, maybe school fees, um, afford holidays. I've also got to pay for Tom to keep living. I've got to make sure that Tom can afford to retire. I've got to make sure that Tom can afford to, to, to eat and to be clothed and to see doctors and so forth. So it is incredibly, you are expensive to your family by being alive. Now, if Tom was to die from an accident, and I feel really bad and weird that I'm actually using this as an example, but I'm hoping it demonstrates the importance of this. Tom is actually is going to take less pressure with him where I don't have to worry about the, his cost of living and that cost and impact on the family overall financial situation. So again, this is why this policy is so incredibly important. And just because you're young and fit doesn't mean you don't need this. You probably need this even more because you've got, you're going to be alive for the next 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. You want to make sure that you can afford to keep living and you've got that protection in place. Now, so this type of policy can be owned and paid for through your superannuation, um, but be careful if you package them up because if you link it to your life cover and you go to claim on, an, on a, a policy that's combined, you may actually end up jeopardizing your life cover. So say, for example, I have a million dollars worth of life and TPD cover and I claim on a TPD policy, I may not have the same level of cover left on the income prote- on the life cover, I should say, sorry, by setting a claim. So make sure you get advice. Maybe you need to look at a standalone TPD policy and a standalone life cover. So if you claim on the TPD, you still have life cover back in place. Again, same thing to consider. There are stepped policy premiums and there are level policy premiums. The stepped is cheaper initially, but becomes increasingly more expensive each year that the policy renews. The level is more expensive up front, but tends to be more consistent in the premiums in the long run. Now, some people like that consistency, knowing, okay, well, my premium is going to cost me $150 per month and it's not going to increase too much above that. Whereas with the level, sorry, the step premium, it will be, you know, initially it'll be maybe $80 a month and next year it'll be $90 a month and next year it'll be $100 per month and the next year it might be $120 a month and next year it might be $150 a month and $180 a month. Some people might think, well, look, I'm on a tight budget now, but my income's only going to increase. I'm happy to take that risk by going with a stepped premium. It's very, very personal. But again, working out how much you need for a TPD, jump on the Money Smart website, then look at that calculator. And again, think about whether you need an own occupation. If you've got a really detailed job, that it requires a lot of training experience and education like the heart surgeon or brain surgeon that I just used or if you need you can get away with just having an any occupation definition for your policy now the fourth most uh, fourth most important I'm not gonna say it's the least important the fourth most important personal insurance policy is life cover which is sometimes called term life policy or death cover and it pays a lump sum amount of money if you were to die And this can include, depending on the policy definitions, suicide. But this tends to be a a waiting period, which is typically 12 months. And if there are mental health flags from, you know, for previous mental health history, you may actually not qualify for this cover. So again, this is why you get advice. I've said get advice a lot in in this podcast. I hope you realize how important it is. Now, this money is to go towards your beneficiaries of the policy. And that might be your partner, that might be your parents, that might be your brother or sister, that might be adult children, that might be to a trust to help take care of your young children. And there also may be an element of a terminal illness cover attached to this policy. So, for example, I have been in situations where, for example, a client of mine was diagnosed with a terminal illness, which means less than 12 months to live. So we were able to get that life policy paid out for them to actually enjoy the benefit of that before they passed away. Now, I want to make a quick note about this. There is another policy called accidental death cover. And quite often this cover is attached to private health insurance or sometimes even credit cards. And it's like a normal token amount of say $50,000. This is very different to life cover. Accidental death cover only pays out in the event of an accident. It will not pay out if you were to be diagnosed with an illness, disease, or suicide. So there is a very limited policy with lots of exclusions, so you really need to be careful of that. Some people have said to me, I don't agree with this or disagree with this, I'm just passing on this observation and comment by others, it's that it's not worth the policy it's written on. I don't know, it depends on your situation, but be aware of that because sometimes you will discover that you have this type of sneaky cover 
on a, attached to some sort of existing insurance or credit card that you didn't even realize that you were paying for. Now, I was reading somewhere the other day that if you are young and you have no financial dependence and you don't have any debts, you don't need this cover. I totally disagree with this. You may not need a large amount of cover. I agree with that. But I do believe you need some cover because if you think about it, what would happen if you were to pass away? You, you might not have any home loans or investment loans, but you might have some outstanding credit card debt at the time of your sudden passing. You know, there might be $8,000 on a credit card. You also might have some outstanding hex debt. You also might have, you know, some, some assets that, you know, might be worth something, but not much at all. And you've left the responsibility to a parent or a friend or a partner that has to take time away from their, their earning capacity and dealing with the grief and stress to deal with your assets. There also are also going to be funeral expenses. Uh, the cost of a funeral is expensive and you don't want to leave that cost or that financial burden on your loved ones. So I disagree with the fact that you don't need this type of cover. Have something rather than nothing at all. At least know that if something happens to you, your parents can afford to wipe out any debts you've got left over. They can afford to take time off work to, to wind up your estate, to, you know, de to declutter your belongings, to, you know, dispose of them in a respectful, kind way, not to be in a situation where you're like, where they think, oh, I can't, aff I don't have time to do this. What do I do? I'll just drop it all off the smith bin. There might be important, valuable things to you that you'd want to be thoughtfully and mindfully donated and given to other people. You wouldn't want to leave that cost of that funeral. So really rethink in a kind mindful, responsible, heartfelt way, whether you want to leave financial responsibilities and stresses and burdens on other people when it comes to life cover. And also the thing is, sorry, don't say authors, the thing is. Now, again, this policy can be owned and paid for via superannuation. And that is what I have done for myself. Now, talking of life and TPD cover, and I should also say, does Tom have life and TPD cover? You better believe he does, as do I. Now, what are the pros and cons from having insurances through super? So my life cover, my TPD cover, and my income protection policy are paid and owned through, owned through my superannuation. What advice I'm just sharing with you is because this is how I was able to afford these policies, especially when I was a single mom on a really tight budget. And I never have let, I've never cut down these policies and I've never changed them at all. The benefit to having personal insurance through your super is that you can access cheaper premiums because the insurance fund often buys insurance policies in bulk. So they're able to pass that discount onto you. It's also very easy to pay. I never need to worry about defaulting on my monthly insurance premium because it's coming out of my superannuation payments. Also, when you apply for insurance through your super, there tends to be fewer health checks because a lot of super funds will actually accept you up to a certain level, like a default level without any sort of detailed, long, lengthy application forms and health checks. And this can be really helpful if you have a high risk job or you've got a pre-existing health condition that can make it difficult to get insurance. So that example where you might have a family history of breast cancer and you're worried that you're going to get an exclusion for breast cancer. When you have you apply for super, sorry, when you apply for insurance through super, some policies will give you an automatic cover without you know, knowing that you've got that family history up to say two, three hundred thousand dollars without having to go through an application or a health check. It's a this is again why you read the fine print. So always go to the PDS. Also, the benefit with super sometimes is you can actually access an increased amount. You can apply for a larger amount of cover than what you would do outside of super. And also the premiums are tax effective in that your Monthly premiums, which can get expensive, are being paid for through your SG contributions, which are taxed at 15% rather than your marginal tax rate. So it can be very advantageous. And if you're looking at you know, your budgets, sometimes people will change. They'll go and apply or see if they can move their existing insurance policies into superannuation to help, I guess, take the stress and pressure off their budgets. 
or they may very, very carefully with professional advice, go and apply for a new insurance policy through their super, wait until it's accepted and in force and they've got the documentation to prove it. And then they'll go and cancel their insurance policies outside of super to help free up their cash flow. Now, I'm not recommending it. I'm just sharing a strategy that people do to help free up the cash flow. Again, something you have to be very, very careful because you may have a really valuable, good quality, comprehensive policy in place that you're paying through out of your cash flow and you're maybe going to a lower quality policy in your super. So again, understanding the difference between the existing policy and the potential new policy before you make any decisions is incredibly important because it's particularly if you've had a change in health, because you might find that as you apply for the new cover, you've got all these exclusions and loadings, which is basically where they increase the cost of your premium because you're at higher risk and you actually realize, oh, actually it's not going to be, I'm going to a lower quality policy through my super. It's actually not worth the savings at all. I'll just keep what I've already got. And you never, ever, ever cancel any existing policies until you have a new policy in, in force and in force in writing. The limitations to having personal insurance through superannuation is you also may not be able to get the same amount of cover. Sometimes they'll have like in the, in the fine print of the PDS, you can only apply up to $2 million worth of life cover. And also that cover may end if you change superannuation accounts. Now you would have heard me talk about this in previous podcasts where I say to you, don't ever roll and consolidate your superannuation policies without checking the insurance policies that you might have attached. So you could actually go and roll, and this would be a disaster if you did, you go and roll an old superannuation policy, not knowing that there's a really good value quality policy, insurance policy attached to that superannuation account to then find out that you can't actually get the new, the same level of cover or the same quality of cover through your new superannuation account. So you want to be really careful if your employer is helping subsidize your premiums for your, your insurances through super. That's quite common because if you leave your employer, they may stop paying that and you need to know, well, what would it cost me to keep that cover? And or how much does it change by or can I even keep that cover as an option to be able to roll it forward? These are all the questions you need to think about. And of course, it, it's quite obvious. The, the more premiums you have coming out of your superannuation, it impacts your balance and it impacts, you know, how much money you'll have in superannuation at retirement. So you need to be mindful of that. But for me, I've weighed up the pros and cons. And for me personally, it works for my advantage to have my life cover, my TPD cover and my income protection paid through my super. But my trauma cover is paid out of my personal cash flow. And, it, you know, it's expensive. I think I pay about $270 per month now for my my trauma cover. And even though that is a lot of money out of my monthly budget, I'm never going to cancel that. That is so incredibly important. Now, I should also point out there's been some changes in the laws and legislation around uh, insurance policies. By law, if you have an inactive superannuation account, which means you have no superannuation <laughs> contributions going in, they can actually cancel your insurances which is really scary. And this is particularly important if you are planning on going overseas and working overseas for a couple of years, you run the risk of your insurances being cancelled. Now, if the, the insurance company goes to do this, they will notify you to let you know, hey, we haven't had any contributions for your superannuation, your superannuation account. You are running the risk of this being deemed as an inactive superannuation account. So we may cancel your superannuation and insurance policies attached. What do you want to do? And you can tick a box which opts you back in. And that's only for a certain period of time. You need to make sure you regularly opt in. But this is, again, the importance of making sure that your contact details are up to date on all of your superannuation policies and your insurance policies so they can easily contact you. That very important email or letter doesn't go missing in the mail or getting lost in cyberspace. Now, um, the thing with this, and I, Sorry, start again. Now, this now what I'm talking about in this podcast, and I know it's a long one, but it's an important one. It is this is which what we're talking about is very top line. There are so many more finer details that comes to insurance policies, personal insurance policies. And this if you go to apply for one of these, the financial planner, the insurance broker, or the insurance company will talk to you about the finer details. I'm just talking about the surface level stuff. It goes way, way more. And when you go to apply for insurance, it is incredibly important that you share everything. 
the more detail, the better. You don't want to accidentally forget about you know, some previous health history or family history or some medical tests that you got done a couple of years ago that might be a red flag for potential future problems. Honesty is the best policy when it comes to personal insurance. The insurance policy are going to ask about your health. They're going to ask about your family history. They're going to ask about your age, your working conditions, your lifestyle. Do you smoke? Do you vape? Do you drink? How much do you drink? How much do you drink per week? These are all things that they take into consideration. Do you ride a motorcycle? cycle? Do you do extreme sports? All these things the insurance company needs to know. If you don't tell them something, they could potentially decline your claim, which is the worst situation possible. So you're better to overshare than undershare, knowing that you have been completely honest and transparent with your insurance company at the time of application is important. Now, When it comes to working out the right level of cover, and I understand everyone is on a really tight budget here, including myself, can I please share this with you? It is better to have something in force rather than nothing at all. If at the moment you can only afford to have $100,000 of life and TBD cover and a teeny tiny income protection policy and a teeny tiny trauma cover, it is better than nothing at all. Do what you can. Do your research, jump on all of those comparison websites so you can get a whole range of quick quotes to get you started. Understand all the different product features, all the different bells and whistles you can add and take away that impacts and changes the premium, makes it go up and makes it go down. So think about your change in health. You see, if you've had a change in health and you have an insurance policy, as I said, you actually run the risk of not being able to be covered for that or having loadings and exclusions on the new policy. And for me, I want to share this with you. I was actually hospitalized because I had really bad postnatal depression and post-traumatic stress syndrome, which all like flourished shortly after having Rocco. Now, I would never, ever be able to apply for any personal insurance whatsoever. I am a complete and absolute decline on on any type of personal insurance application. So you need to bear this in mind. And insurance companies are humans. If you have a unique situation, get on the phone and speak to them and ask if you can have a conversation with an underwriter and whether they would look at your application under special consideration. Now, I had to help Tom in doing this because Tom is an equine physio and trying to explain to a, uh, he's a trained human physio and has a master's in equine physio, but trying to explain to an insurance company what Tom does for a living and the types of risks, because they're not the normal type of risks that everyone experiences, we had to go through a very detailed application process where Tom had to have a lengthy call with an underwriter explaining what he does for a living and explaining what the real risks are and how he's trained and qualified and what safety procedures he has in place. And it ended up the insurance, um, I remember eavesdropping in this conversation while Tom was on the phone and it was funny, the the underwriter, he was asking all of these questions because they were intrigued because they'd never had an application like this before. So So things to think about. Uh, So another important thing I want you to to look at is you may actually have some cover in place. You might already have cover in place with an old superannuation policy that's still active. You may actually have insurance cover through your employer's contract. But keep in mind, if you leave your employer, that policy may lapse or cancel. Find out whether you can maintain it. Find out what the cost it is. And also ask who is the insurance company behind this employer insurance policy? Are they a reputable company? Do they meet their claims? Do some research on them. Look at their claims. Look at their reviews. When you're looking at your superannuation statements to see if you've got the existing policies in place, look at your statements first of all. And if it doesn't make sense or if you're not entirely sure and you're having trouble and feeling a little bit overwhelmed reading your superannuation statement, which is not abnormal, pick up the phone and call your superannuation provider and say, hey, do you mind if I just check? I just need to understand exactly what personal insurances I've got in place attached to this superannuation policy. And they will share with you how much you're paying, what are the benefit periods, what are the waiting periods, because then you can work out, right, where are the holes? Where are the bridges I need to gap? Do I need to take out a different policy? Now, I'm going to wrap up this policy. It's almost, sorry, I'm not going to wrap up this policy. I'm going to wrap up this podcast because it's coming up to an hour. So I do appreciate you may have had to stop and start this policy on your, uh, this policy again, I said again, this podcast as you on your way to work or you're walking, you're doing your morning walks, whatever it may be. But please let me, please let me remind you, you will never regret taking insurance out. 
you will sleep well at night. And to share with you, when I have gone through insurance claims with clients, you could always have justified more cover. And even when I've done these claims, I've still looked at this and gone, you know what, having an extra $500,000 or an extra $100,000 or an extra million dollars worth of cover would have actually been great. It You can very easily underinsure yourself. And most Australians are underinsured. And there is, so there really is never really enough when it comes to claim time. When you look at a family that's lost the, the father, the breadwinner of the family or the mother, the breadwinner, and you see the impact on the family, knowing that they have no mortgage to worry about, knowing that they've got some money to be able to afford the same lifestyle, they can still keep the kids in private school fees if they are, or they can still afford to help pay for childcare and daycare. They can still afford to be able to go on a holiday. They can still afford to eat. This is where these policies are worth their weight in gold. And if you have insurance and you never go to claim and you think, well, that was such a waste of thousands and thousands of dollars, you're looking at it the wrong way. You're looking at it in the really wrong way. You see, you're actually lucky. It means that you've been lucky and fortunate enough to never have to submit a claim, which means you have never gotten that sick or that ill or suffered a major accident that's seriously been traumatic to yourself and to your family. You're lucky if you never have to claim. And I will leave with this with you. If you leave this and delay this and think, okay, I'll do it next week, next month, next year. The problem is, is the moment you don't feel well, the moment you make that doctor's appointment, the moment you call the ambulance, the moment you're told to go and see a specialist, it's quite often too late to go and apply for insurance. You've missed the boat. That ship has sailed. Take out and look at personal insurance policies while you're fit, healthy, and strong so that you have a comprehensive, high-quality insurance policy in place. Don't be like this lovely lady who messaged me the other day on Instagram. She was 33. She suffered a stroke and she was just about to submit her income protection policy application when she stood up and was hit out, knocked out by this stroke, which has impacted her ability to return back to work and will most likely mean that she can never return to her work because it's actually had a neurological impact on her cognitive skills. So this is a sign, this is a warning. We all need to look at this seriously Make sure that we protect our financial situation as well as our financial future when it looks comes to our well-being, our financial goals, and our financial dreams. Thank you, everyone, for listening. This is Sugar Mama's Fireplay podcast, and I would greatly appreciate it if you can leave me a rating and a review and you feel really responsible and empowered listening to this conversation around personal insurance policies income protection, trauma cover, life cover, and TPD cover. You've heard it here first. Ciao for now.